Swing low. Sweet chair. Oh, we're on. Okay. Hi. How are you? Just doing a little bit of singing while I'm waiting for the next session, which is tips for succeeding on the Windows Phone Store. Uh, hopefully you're still with us. Uh, and if you are just joining for this session, welcome. I'm Paula Barish. I'm a technical evangelist with Microsoft Canada. Uh, I do a lot of these types of things and uh, try to add a little bit of humor into it as well. But the, the bottom line is what we're going to talk about here in this session is not about the technology and not about implementation details. In fact, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here today in this session has nothing to do specifically with Windows Phone or Windows 8, but it's actually lessons that you can sort of apply across any sort of app store that you might be thinking of. The whole idea being you're building an application, uh, you should be treating it like a business. There's some things that you should keep in mind when you're actually doing these, uh, building the, these experiences for your applications because there are motivations that you have behind this, right? Either you want to get paid, so you're trying to drive revenue, uh, or you just want downloads of your application, whatever it is that your motivations are. Hopefully, you'll get a lot of uh, good tips and tricks with this. So um, without further ado, let's just get to it. We're all here because we love to build apps. We have tears of joy in our eyes because we're just having so much fun with the code. We love async methods. We love the fact that we can use JavaScript and C Sharp together and all the goodness that's associated with it. We love the modern UI. We love all this stuff. We love to build apps. That's why we're all here. We all want to learn to do better. We all want to, to, uh, to build the greatest app ever, you know, making Angry Birds feel like it's a, like it's a piece of whatever type of thing. But there's a little bit of a reality check here. And the bottom line here is that it's really, really tough to actually get your application downloaded from the, the store for the first time. Okay, So that's that I think everybody understands, right? It's very difficult to get yourself noticed and actually convince a user that he or she should download your app. But beyond that, there's even more uh, detritus and more sort of issues with actually getting your application to the nirvana, which is basically have a user use your application over and over and over again. In fact, only one in four applications that are ever downloaded in any app store out there today ever gets used more than once. So a user may download your app and you've made it you know, a good portion of the way because your app got noticed. But the fact of the matter is, once that app has been downloaded, the odds are still against you. Three out of four applications will never get used after the user opens that app once. So how do you get past that? Well, there's a few things that you need to do. First, you've got to get noticed. Second of all, you have to have a great experience and a rapport with your user. So this is really what we're going to talk about in this, uh, this, this presentation. It's all about you know, all the types of things that you can do to make sure that you are successful as an app developer and publisher and to make sure that your application has the best possible experience and rapport with your user. So how do we do that? First thing you need to understand is that marketing really actually does matter. Now, marketing is a little bit of a, uh, a bad word around some people. I mean, we're all technologists to some extent, uh, you know, and frankly, we all love to code. We all are here to learn to build amazing application functionality using the technologies that we have, like C Sharp or HTML and JavaScript or XAML, VB, whatever, right? We get that. But when you've built an app, whether or not you've incorporated it or not, you've actually built a business because you're developing a product and you've published a product. And as such, your motivation for building and publishing that product is likely because you want to get known for it, right? You, you want to have some sort of recognition around it, whether that means that you're giving your application away and people love it, or you're actually charging for that application, whether that's straight out charging or through ad revenue or in-app purchase, whatever it is that you're doing. And you're motivation in that case would be revenue, for example. But in order to get there, we need to make sure that we have a user base that knows who, what your app is and what are the va what's the value of your application. So we think a lot about you know, functionality, design, quality, all that kind of stuff from a stability standpoint, but we don't really think about, about the business side of things. So let's talk a little bit about trials, because trials are one of the most important ways to actually get your application noticed, especially if, well, well to be honest, if, if you are in a situation where you're charging for your application. So there's a few ways that you can actually build a trial, and we'll get into that in a bit. But the bottom line here is that you don't want to have your application 
without a trial of some sort. Because users don't, they're not used to buyer beware in app stores and I don't think that model will ever work going forward as well. You have to give your users a taste of exactly what your application can do. Because if you don't, then you're going to end up in a situation where the user's not going to take a chance in your app. And that's basically a lost sale right there. So let's think about it. Why is a trial good? Well, there is a API within uh, Windows and Windows Phone called Is Trial. And basically, this, this API as part of the platform brings back a Boolean value, so true or false. So dot is trial equals true means that your application is in trial mode and the user hasn't paid for it. Now, why would you actually build a trial? Now, it's really important because what this, and this is a statistic that we've gotten from the Windows Phone Store in aggregate. So we found that applications that include a built-in trial mode using the is trial functionality get 70 times the number of downloads than applications that don't. We also see that in the Windows Phone Store, there's a 10% trial to pay conversion rate on average. Okay, mileage may vary, but that's basically what we're seeing, which is very, very high to be honest compared to a lot of the other stores. So basically what this means is that you have, if you add a trial to your application and build, build it into your application as in dot is trial, for example, you get seven times the number of paid apps than you would otherwise. That's materially significant, right? So think about that. That's why you should actually build in a trial into your application. So that's all well and good. So what is a trial? Well, we already talked about the fact that we have the is trial method within Windows, Windows Phone and Windows 8. And you can use that. And in fact, that is the preferred way that we recommend you use trials within your applications. Or alternatively, you can actually create your own app uh, as two different apps, a light version and a pro version, for lack of a better term. And this is a, a way that a lot of people say, for example, on Google Play and the Apple App Store and, and BlackBerry actually build out their, their trials, right? So you have a, a light version of the app, which is its own separate app from the actual paid version. Now, both strategies that you see here have pros and cons. We suggest you use the in-app trial because it makes the upsell and the conversion rate a lot easier. So there's less friction for the user to actually buy your application um, because they don't have to go to the store and get a whole separate app as a paid app. But there's also the school of thought where if you provide two applications, a trial version and a paid version uh, that are separate applications, you have twice the surface area that the user can actually find your application in the app store. Now, I actually think this is a bit of a fallacy. And the reason why I think that is because, yes, technically and statistically, two apps is better than one app from finding things in a lot of ways. But let's take a look at the probability of getting your application noticed within the store. The Apple App Store has 500,000 plus, plus apps. Windows Phone Store has itself, which has fairly low market share compared to their competitors right now, but it is growing. We have 135,000 applications in the store, and that's growing at an astronomical rate. So even if you have twice the number of apps in the store, it's still very difficult for you to get noticed. So why don't you actually do the right things and market your app the proper way, get the word out, and use the in-app trial mode because the upsell is a whole lot easier for you to actually make use of. So that's just some th ideas and strategies around how you implement the trial. Uh, or how you, how you go about like doing the trial. Now, as far as like what you do as far as the actual trial itself within your application, there's a lot of different ways that you can actually implement that. And this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch, but these are some of the most common ones that I've seen. So the most common one is uh, limited functionality. So you basically lock down your application so that the user that's in trial mode doesn't actually get all of the functionality of the application. And that's pretty common. Um, I'm going to skip over the second one because we deal with that in a little bit later. The third one is, you know, you can only use the application a certain number of times before the application is completely locked and you have to buy it. Likewise, the alternative to that kind of idea is, you know, it's time bombed. So you can only use the application for three days or however many days that you want. And at that point, then you actually have to pay for the app as well. There are some other clever ways of doing things as well. So you can actually have it so that, you know, you're throttling by transactions. So you can only do number three, three transactions uh, in, in the application before you have to pay for it, or 10 transactions, or whatever it is, um, depending on how your application's set up. Or you can throttle it as well in a time period. So you can only use you know, three transactions per minute 
uh, transactions per minute, uh, and then you have a cool down period or something like that. So it makes the app a little less useful unless you, uh, if you throttle it down that way, so that you can sort of show the value of the application, yet also not give away all the application as well. So that's some of the ways that you can do it. I'm sure there's a lot more, and happy to have a conversation about those other ideas uh, once, um, uh, once we get into the Q&A uh, right after this session. So let's talk about the principles of the trial because this is really important. The first thing you have to do, make sure of is that you don't give away the application that you're, you're, you're charging for, right? Really think hard about what you want to put into the trial and what you want to keep out of the trial because understanding the motivations of your users will be a very, very important component of this because you don't want to give everything away because then that won't motivate a user to actually buy the application. Likewise, if you lock it up too much, you, you need to, you, you, the user is not going to see the value, and we'll get into that in a bit. But the whole understanding here is that you have to understand what motivates your user base in aggregate, right? So, what are the things that will make a user want to buy your application? You know, what piece, pieces of functionality should you sort of at least provide a taste of so that they can see a bit, bit of a, the value of the application, yet not give away so much of the application that uh, there is no need to actually pay for the app because they get enough of the functionality that they need to actually move forward. So it's, it's kind of a, a tricky balance. You have to think about how, you know, how much to put in and out and things like that, but that's something to think about. Likewise, you have to make sure that the application is compelling. You don't want to limit the functionality to the point where it's crippled, right? You want to be able to show value, and that's really the crux of the matter when you're talking about applications is, how do you actually show value of the application, yet make the user want to buy the application in the end too, right? So leave them wanting more. Show them a little taste of exactly what the application is capable of and make them want that extra bit of functionality that they have to have the upsell for, right? That is really what you want to do. Don't limit the, tr don't give it the, uh, the app away in the trial, but at the same time make it compelling enough that there is some value that, that the user can actually see. Now, the third component of this is, is really where some interesting things happen because when I talk to developers um, and they're charging for their applications, they actually don't think about this, or, or surprisingly enough, or a lot of them don't, is if you're charging for your application, one of the main motivations you have as a business is to drive revenue. And the way you drive revenue is, you know, you charge for the application, whatever it is, or in-app purchase, whatever. But you may provide a trial, and you really should. Why not get paid on the trial as well by providing ads within it, right? So it's almost like it's a win-win situation. If the user's in trial, you get ad impression revenue. Might not be as much as actually getting the user to pay for the app. Likewise, maybe ad revenue is a great way for you to actually drive a lot of revenue anyways, and you're less worried about charging for the app. You never know, right? But the bottom line is you get paid either way whether the user's in trial or whether the user's actually paid for your application. Win-win. So that brings us to the next point, right? So now you've decided that you're going to charge for your application, say, for example. So how do you actually charge? Like, what are you going to charge for your application? Well, this is where perception and reality are not necessarily the same thing. And you really have to get into the mind of your, your typical user in order to figure out exactly what that right price range will be. So, for example, this first thing that you see right here is like a buck ninety nine for that. I am not paying a buck ninety nine for that app because it just makes no sense to me, right? If the price is too high, users just won't bite and they won't buy that app. Likewise, and this is the interesting one, is if the price is too low, the perceived value of your application you're cheapening it because of the fact that if it's priced too low, you may think that you're giving it away and you're going to get more users to, to to buy that application. The user, on the other hand, is actually thinking to themselves, if the app developer and publisher is actually only charging 99 cents or whatever it is for that application, it can't be too good. I think I'll pass, right? So it's kind of that um, you have to be very careful. And a good example of this is, uh, say, for example, the Ferrari and whatever Ferrari you're talking about. They are very expensive cars, but how often do you see a car that actually costs like 300000 to build? Well, obviously, there's a high margin on the Ferrari, right? If a Ferrari costs $20,000 for, say, for example, that was the cost of actually building the app, uh, the, the, the app, building the car, 
which it probably is a little higher, but just for the sake of argument, let's say it's twenty thousand dollars as the cost of materials, and so you charge thirty thousand dollars for the Ferrari instead. The main level of clientele that you are char you are trying to attract with the Ferrari, which is the affluent uh, community, probably right. They are not going to buy it because they perceive value of that car is less because they feel that. They, even though the car is the same car that you would be charging $30,000 as opposed to $300,000, the perceived value isn't there because it's, it's, it looks and feels cheap from the price alone, right? So keep that in mind. You have to be able to tr price your application in the right manner. And this is where I talked about, you know, perception is reality. Um, let's take a look at some aggregate information from 2011. So the average price of an app, uh, iPhone app in Apple's App Store in 2011 was $1.61. I think that's US dollars, but regardless, we're close to parity here. A Tim Hortons coffee costs $1.90, okay? Now let's think about this. Users will buy that cup of coffee in the morning and not think a second about it, right? They'll line up for 20 minutes or whatever it is at, in, in the lineup at, at the Tim Hortons drive through and get that coffee and go. And they won't think anything of it. They'll pass off that toonie and then they'll, they'll, they'll be on their merry way and have uh, enjoyment for 20 minutes or however long it takes them to actually uh, uh, enjoy that beverage. The iPhone app in this case, for example, they will, a user will take a look at that and really think hard about $1.99 for that application. Hmm, do I really want to buy it? And they'll think about it for days, weeks even sometimes, right? So it's very, very difficult. And, and that, this is something that once they download, it's basically theirs forever, right? You know, you can re-download it and everything else like that. It's this perception of value is really, really different, right? So that cup of coffee, which is $1.90, costs more than the average cost of an iPhone application. You know, users don't perceive that cup of coffee in the, in, in the app as being the same price in a lot of ways. They think of it in very different terms. So you have to get past the perception that your application doesn't have value because users are skeptical and when they see an application, the first thing they come to mind is, well, I'm going to take a look at it, but I'm not sure I'm going to buy it because I don't know if it's got the value that I'm looking for. Very, very, very important to understand that. So there's a number of different rules for pricing the app and, and just thinking about your application as a business altogether. And we're going to go through four that I find are the most common. So the first one is addressing your uh, addressable market. I understand your addressable market. So who is your tar target demographic? Like what users, types of users, is your application going to be appropriate for? And beyond that, does this application solve a problem that this group of users have? Because if it doesn't, then you probably should go back to the drawing board a bit and figure out exactly what will compel the user in this target demographic to buy your application. Likewise, what is the affluence or the buying power of your, app, of your sweet spot demographic, right? How much buying power do they have? Like, if you have a medical imaging um, application, mainly for doctors and such, you will have a situation where that doctor will probably be able to pay more for that application than, say, for example, a student uh, learning to become a doctor, for example, right? So if it's, if it's a student demographic that you're looking for, you may have to be very careful about charging too much for that application. Likewise, in the case of a doctor, you might have to be very careful about charging too little for that application because of perceived value. So there's buying power and then there's perception power as well so think about that and then finally what is the the population of your target demographic overall and in canada or the us or britain or you know in the middle east wherever that you're actually selling your application like how do you actually provide uh, the right value for each of these geographic reason, regions so think about your addressable market and how you can actually deal with the, the, those types of things Rule number two is knowing your competition. So when you when you're building your app, not when you built your app, but when you're building your app, not even building, when you're actually designing and thinking about the app idea that you have, can you name the top three or top five or top ten competitors that have apps in this in the store already? And how is your application going to differentiate itself against those other applications? And be brutally honest, what's better about your competition that, that compared to your application? 
And also, what does your application do that's better than your competition? Because understanding those gaps and where your application is even better in some cases will be the key differentiator in how you actually sell your application. And you have to have a plan for addressing the gaps that your application has uh, compared to your competitors and whether or not you want to address those, uh, those gaps themselves. Okay? And then also, think about the future. Like, can you see new competitors coming into this space? Like, will the space of your problem set uh, that you're solving with your application, will it morph over time? It probably will, because most, sof most software and most businesses do evolve over time, right? For example, when micro Microsoft first started out, we were basically a you know, client-based operating system with DOS, for example. Then the graphical user interface came by, and then the internet changed a whole lot of things, and we had to adapt and evolve. Some people may say that we took a little bit of time to evolve. That's fair, but the bottom line is we did evolve, right? So you have to think about evolving your business as well, because if you don't, then you're going to be left by the wayside. Rule number three, treat your application like a business. Talked about the first point already. You've got to market your application. So for example, there's these great templates that are basically websites built to, to spec already that you can download for free for your application. And you can use something like, say, for example, Windows Azure, which has Azure websites that you can actually publish up to 10 websites on a single account for free. I mean, that's a pretty de decent deal, right? At the very least, you should think about putting your application in the web, like uh, as far as marketing your application with a website, showing off the application, maybe even having a video of how to use the application. It's a way to market your application beyond just the store itself. And it doesn't cost you anything. The templates are free. Azure websites are free. Just go to azure.com and you can see actually where you can uh, sign up for these things. Or you can contact me and I can get you in touch with the right people or get you set up uh, with, uh, with a phone call or something like that. But the bottom line here is do what you need to do to market your application. Create a Twitter account for your application as well. Right? Very simple. Again, free. And you can actually market your application that way. There's lots of grassroots ways of doing things. Also, getting back to the business side of things, right? What is the volume of downloads that you expect to have per year, for example, in your for your application? Because basically, if you can estimate that accurately, that's telling you how much revenue you're going to get back from your application. And that is a key indicator of how successful you think your application is going to be. Also, it'll let you figure out how you're going to evolve your application moving forward as well. Because if you can sort of accurately forecast what your application's revenue is going to be, you can allocate some of the funds that you actually buy, uh, that you get back as part of you know, your research and development. So a good example is you can take advantage as a business, potentially, of your application using things like research and development tax credits that the government of Canada gives away. You may not have realized this, but if you have an application and you have a business, I think you may have to be incorporated. But if you incorporate your business, you have the ability to get tax credits from the government to actually offset some of the costs of building your business while you're actually doing it via research and development. Amazing opportunities, just even right there, right? So is there a seasonality to your app? So if you have a tax application, for example, chances are you're going to get a whole lot more downloads between mid-January and, and early May compared to, say, October and September and all those things, right? Because tax season is in the earlier part of the year. So that's another way to sort of determine what the seasonality of your application is going to be. And that will also determine what, your, what your, uh, your revenue flow will be throughout various parts of the year as well, which is obviously important as a business. You also have to think about what are the inputs to actually building your application from a cost perspective. Hardware, licenses, maybe rent, utilities such as electricity, paying you know, designers or contractors to help you build the application and, and make it look great or whatever it is that you're doing. These are all things that are very, very important from, an, uh, from a business uh, costing standpoint. And then you may have carrying costs associated with it as well. So what are the things to maintain your application? You should have a good roadmap for how you're going to evolve your application over time. Upgrading your application shows that the, the application is healthy, that it's living, that your users have confidence in because they see that you are paying attention and you are treating it like a business as well. So these are things that you have to keep in mind. Uh, so you know you may have to um, you know hire somebody to answer emails about support. Like maybe there's bug reports or something like that, and you have to have somebody answer all the emails that come in about that. Or maybe you know somebody just to answer PR about your application and things like that. 
If it's not yourself, then you may have to hire somebody to help you out with that. And then the fourth rule is basically keeping your options open. Be flexible, right? Your, uh, your, your, your application will change over time. Your business will change over time. The example of Microsoft and the internet, you know, we had to evolve. Otherwise, we would have been left by the wayside. Your business will likely face those types of things as well. Maybe not at the same scale, but certainly you will have to evolve your business and be flexible with your application to adapt to the new uh, you know, environments that you might have to, uh, to adapt to. So just keep that in mind. Another good strategy around keeping your options open is putting your application on sale. This is really interesting because there's a number of app aggregators out there that exist on the various different stores that are basically just an app that has a list of apps that are on sale within the store. So if you pre-price your application, you go to the top of the list of those things and you may actually get more downloads as a result of that. It also builds goodwill with your user base that might be considering to buy your application. You can use this as a marketing tool. All those types of things are available to you. Likewise, you may have to scale up. You may have to hire people. We talked a bit about this as treating it as a business as well. You need to make sure that as your application becomes popular, you don't, you don't basically die under the weight of the volume of the, those application downloads as well. Because as your app becomes more popular, you're going to have to answer more email. You're going to have to you know, think harder about value and, and, and evolving your application as well, which means that you may have to hire people to help you with that. So just be aware of that. And then this also has to do with partnerships. So maybe there's ways that you can partner with other application developers, um, independent software vendors, you know, that have a service that maybe you can partner with and things like that. Just keep your eye options open because this is a sign of a healthy app, uh, application company if you're actually able to do those things correctly. So we talked a bit about treating it as a business, but now we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk a little bit about how you get spotlighted or featured within the Windows Phone Store. Um, these, this part of the presentation is more focused on, um, on, on the things that the Windows Phone Store team actually look for in an application to get featured, but a lot of the stuff, again, the lessons are, are probably transferable across. And there's three main sort of levels that we look at. Functionality, utility, and delight. And we'll get through each of these things in the next few slides. And really, this is, uh, if, if, if you want to get featured or spotlighted, you have to be, have check marks across all these different things, right? So let's take a look at functionality. The first part is core functionality. The application says what it's supposed, uh, does what it says it does. It doesn't crash. It's performant, all those types of things, right? Table stakes. If it doesn't do any of this stuff, you're out. You're not going to get spotlighted. I guarantee you that. Okay, so just keep that in mind. The second point to functionality is content. Now, not every single application is an RSS reader, for example, but a lot of these applications do have content beyond just, you know, buttons and things like that. And this includes games, right? Game content. Is the content of good quality? Because if the content is not co good quality content, then the information or the value of the polish of the application itself is just not there. So it's part of the experience. The content is really, really important, and you should make sure that you pay attention to that as you're moving forward. If you don't, again, you don't get spotlighted. And then the third part of functionality is ease of use. The application should not be a quagmire of all these different options that make the user have to really think hard about how to use the application. It's very, very difficult to have an application that's too complicated and actually get featured on the on the uh, the Windows Phone Store because uh, because of the fact that the whole idea behind a, a smartphone application or a mobile application is should be easy to use. Now that's not to say that you have an application that doesn't allow the user to explore the application and find out new things along the way. In fact, that's something that I would encourage. You know. Add delight to the to the experience of your application by you know having I want I don't want to call them hidden features but features that you just don't you know show off the bat because it shows that you know you, you've thought about the app experience and things like that as well but it should be easy to use no manuals required those types of things okay the second tier that we're looking at is utility and the first component of this is feature set is your application making use of the feature set that's appropriate for Windows Phone. A great example of this is uh, Live Tiles. So a great Live Tile experience is almost required to have a good featured uh, a spotlight capability if your application has a context where a Live Tile would make sense, right? 
Live tiles provide great information to the user on the start screen. Uh, same with lock screens, for example. Like say, for example, your application runs under lock screen. I would strongly suggest that you think about live tiles and lock screens as ways to sort of augment your application because these are ways that sort of light up Windows Phone in general. And we want applications spotlighted that really light up our platform as well. So keep that in mind. It also has to be visually impactful. So making great use of the modern UI, understanding what the modern UI is and, and working with it. So go to design.windowsphone.com if you have any questions around how to build great designed applications using the modern UI on Windows Phone. It provides you with some great, great examples and, and, and guidance as to how you can sort of move towards a great experience using the modern UI. It has to look beautiful, right? Because applications that look beautiful catch eyes. And beyond just getting spotlighted, if your application is beautiful, app users will actually want to use your application. It's part of the stickiness, which is the next component, right? I talked about the fact that Windows, uh, like apps on mobile platforms, even though they're downloaded, only one in four gets open more than once beyond that. This is the stickiness, right? We want applications that have a stickiness, that compel users to want to use the app over and over and over again. And the applications that will be able to do that are the ones that will get spotlighted. And then the fourth component of this, the utility component, is the originality. So it's not that your app idea has to be original, OK? Yes, it could be an original idea, and that's great. But what we mean by this is that your implementation of your application provides originality. Does it do it in a different way? Or does it, does it provide you a, a better way of being productive or being less bored or whatever it is that you're trying to, to provide with your application? The whole point here is, is that you're addressing a problem space and you're using original thinking to actually deliver the right experience to the user. And that's really what that's all about. It doesn't have to be an original idea. It has to be the way that you implement your application. And then the final component, which is delight. And this is the part that's a little more fuzzy, I guess you could say, right? It's got to do with things that are, are, are emotional in connections, right? So it's got a wow factor. When you see the application, you just know, wow, that's an amazing application. I got to have that application, right? So it's, it's, just, it's just about creating that emotional connection at first run. And that's really what the wow factor is. A good example of this is the, the application called Cocktail Flow, which is an adult beverage uh, application. It's like a bartender's app. Amazing, amazing experience. It's got a wow factor. It, the content is great, you know, and they've evolved it over time by adding packages that uh, you can download for free if you paid for the application. But whole, the whole point is that it's visually appealing. It makes use of animations in subtle ways that make the application feel alive, yet you know, it's not getting in the way, the animations. There's lots of things that you can discover along the way, yet it's easy to use. It's just a beautiful, beautiful application and one that makes you want to come back to it. And that's really kind of what the wow factor is. And the design is really part of that. And I talked about modern UI and everything else like that. Understand the modern UI. So get familiar with it. Get familiar with how to use typeface and use the, the you know, various different components of the modern UI style. Design.windowsphone.com is really, really important for you to, to get to know. Um, really start immersing yourself in modern UI if you want to be uh, featured in the, um, in, as, or spotlighted in the Windows Phone Store because we want the applications that have great experiences on the modern UI to be the ones that sort of show up. The, exp uh, the, the difference around that is games, because games are slightly different because they have their own UIs. But even beyond that, the design of your game should be quality. It should have polish, right? So hire a designer if you're, if you're not a, a designer type of person to create those sprite graphics as appropriate and things like that so that you know, it does feel like it's a beautiful, beautiful, immersive experience beyond just you know, the mechanics of the game. And then finally, uh, this says WP7, but really it's Windows Phone platform features. It's basically, again, making use of the features that we really want to light up our platform with. Like the, the things that when you see a Windows Phone commercial, you know, like with Gwen Stefani or Cam Newton, the quarterback of the Carolina pa Panthers, what are the things that we're showing or we're getting the, the, uh, the celebrities to show off about Windows Phone that we think are awesome? Live tiles, a lock screen, the modern UI, you know, flow. Uh, the ability to have uh, lenses and cameras if that's something that you're doing, things like that. So 
make relevant use of the platform features that we provide within Windows Phone. And if you do that in an amazing way, an immersive way, with great experience and visual impact and, and all those things, you'll end up with this, uh, an application that will likely have a much better chance of getting spotlighted than otherwise. So that is basically the end of this session. I thank you for uh, coming to, uh, to this uh, day of Windows Phone development. I hope you found it valuable. And uh, we'll take it to questions probably after a little bit of a short break, I'd imagine. But uh, uh, at the very least, I hope you did find this uh, valuable. And feel free to give me a shout. Again, I'll put my contact information right there. And uh, feel free to give me a shout at any point. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. So with that, bring home the cheddar. Let's build apps. Let's have some fun. And out.